Hello, everyone. Today is August 24th, 2021. Welcome to In the Loop. I'm your host, John Pollard, Director of Education for Pricescope.com. We are the world's largest diamond and jewelry community, teaching consumers how to buy diamonds for more than 20 years. Pricescope attracts more than 400,000 unique visitors per month, and we list over a half million diamonds from the world's most recognized and reputable online sellers. A collection of five-star rated companies known for honesty, best practices, and consumer protection. Our public forum has over 100,000 registered users, including a unique culture of experienced consumers who offer free education and advice to shoppers because they like diamonds, they like jewelry, and they like helping other people. If you're not yet a member, we invite you to register today and join the Price Scope community. In the Loop is designed to bring you information, but it's also interactive. We invite you to send in questions during the session. We'll select some of those and answer them before the session concludes. If there are any questions we don't get to, we'll follow up later with an email. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce my guest today. He has been a diamond industry journalist for over 25 years. He's appeared in interviews with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, CNN, and other mainstream channels. He's the recipient of five Eddie Awards from Folio Magazine. His blog has received two Jesse H. Neal Awards for editorial excellence in business media. His comedy writing has been featured on Comedy Central and Saturday Night Live. He is a recipient of the prestigious American Gem Society Triple Zero Award for Industry Service. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Rob Bates Author. He is the news director for JCK, the jewelry industry's number one publication. He is Rob Bates. Rob, thank you for joining us. How are you? How's life in these interesting times? Uh, challenging, like uh, for everybody, but uh, I'm getting ready to go to Las Vegas in, uh, tomorrow. So that should be uh, definitely different with everybody with masks. So um, I think it's been two years since I've seen you, but I'll see you again there this year. That, that feels good, good to be getting back. All right. That. I'm glad to see that. And uh, we're all, you know, we're all doing our best hanging in. Uh, what else can you do? It's been interesting, and I think it's going to be interesting for a while. Let's put it that way. Are you working uh, now from home still, or are you back in the office these days? Yeah, I've been I've been working from home. I think the last time I was in the office, uh, it's a shame. I, we're right now in the nicest office I've ever worked in, but I haven't worked in our office since February 2020. So yeah, I've been at home for most of the time. And uh, there's a family home in New Jersey. Uh, right now I live in New York, but we go kind of back and forth sometimes depending on uh, our need for space. And you have a you have a son that's, is he seven or eight years old? Seven, yes. yes. Seven years old. I'm not actually in, in his room right now. So uh, <laughs> I was, well, I was going to ask, you know, there's been a big pivot where suddenly home spaces have become our workspaces. Yes. For, for you, that's really interesting because you interact with so many how has um, COVID and the situation changed the way that you approach stories? You know, I mean, I look, it's always better to meet people face to face. I always feel that way. It's good to go to parties. It's good to network. You know, the you can call people up on the phone, but they're a lot nerve, more nervous. But when you meet somebody face to face, they are usually a lot more uh, you know, free with, with what they say. So uh, definitely face-to-face -face is a million times better than the phone or Zoom or any of these other things. But, uh, you know, you, you deal with it and uh, it's, it is what it is. You know, you can kind of talk to somebody online a million times, but it's, it's just, uh, it really is different when you, when you talk to them face-to-face, -face. it's just a different experience. You know, we do a, a podcast and uh, yeah, you know, it's definitely a different kind of, vibe when the person's in the room when they're, when they're not uh in the recording studio with you so it's just it's different it's okay i mean i i survive i manage but it's uh, i definitely liked it better before as i think <laughs> just about the rest of the world does so yeah we're at a time where zoom became a verb faster than google did so yeah. uh, the technology thing you know i mean i think i love the advances in technology but at the same time i hate how much we rely on technology right now yeah, I could, uh, and it's weird. People will do Zoom instead of phone calls, which I just don't, you know, like when it used to be like 
you, you, you have me just a phone call and all of a sudden you have to have a whole Zoom thing, but whatever, that's a rant for a different day. Okay, well, so let's get to the, the topics here. Um, I wanna talk about uh, your book and I also wanna talk about your career. Let's start with the book. Um, you have one of the most interesting and enviable jobs in the business, I'd say. You're a top journalist. I'm watching over an industry that never lacks for stories. I do want to get into your career highlights, but first, yes. let's talk about this. A Murder Forever is available on Amazon. This is Rob's first fiction novel and the first installment in his Diamond District mystery series. I'd like to clarify that I don't plan any spoilers here, uh, but this is a fascinating work. And I do want to discuss some of the characters and some of the content. Rob, you write about so much real in the diamond and jewelry industry. When did you decide you wanted to create a work of fiction? And what was the inspiration for that decision? So many uh, years ago at JCK, we had a person who worked with us, uh, Jonathan Harrington, who was a mystery writer and um before he left, one of the last books he did was actually about the diamond industry. And I helped him a little bit with that. And I'm actually a character in, in the book. And um, we kind of discussed, uh, you know, at some point we discussed, um, you know, collaborating. And, you know, I've always, you know, as you mentioned, I've always had uh, try to do some things that are a little creative beyond my normal job, which is creative to some extent. But, you know, you I like to have kind of a uh, another outlet. So it was something I've been thinking about. And I have a friend who's published a bunch of books and I, I met his uh, publisher and he was the one who he said it was a good idea. And he was the one who suggested making the main character female because that's the target audience for uh, mystery novels. And um, I reached out to him later and he totally ignored me, but it didn't matter. You know, once I, once I started writing it, I was like, okay, this is pretty good. This is fun. And I, I liked the idea, um, especially at first of just kind of writing it and nobody really knew I was doing it. And I, it was just kind of something that I didn't know if it was ever going to sell, but it was just something I was just doing it for the pleasure of it and to see if I could do it. So, um, and, you know, you have to write what you know. And um, I really don't know much about anything else besides the diamonds at this point. Uh, so um, I just decided, that, you know, I, I thought it would be marketable. I thought it would be interesting. Um, and uh, that's it. You know, I eventually found an agent and a publisher. And I mean, it's a long process and it took a long time to write. But uh, that was it. I just th thought it'd be a fun thing to do. And it's usually pretty fun. I, ju I just finished the second one. So the second one's coming out in February. Okay, we'll and talk about that soon. That'll be great. And you mentioned, you've already mentioned the main character. I want to talk about her in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, the two primary characters for me are Mimi and Max. And I understand those are your late mother and your grandfather's names. Yes. Are there any similarities in personas or were those just honorifics? Uh, I mean, there's some similarities, but I would say they're mostly honorifics to to them i mean you know it's my grandfather died like uh, 40 years ago so it's you know it's my memories of him are very f fuzzy and you know it's just i i would say there's there's some things that are similar but not really you know i th i think my grandfather was a decent man and and the, the max character is a decent man but um uh, now was there anybody in the book who you modeled after a friend or family, you don't need to say their names, uh, who you modeled after a friend or a family member? Mm, I mean, everybody's a composite of, of different people, you know, that I met and that I knew, but, you know, and, and there's obviously a bit of me in every character because that's just how it is. And you kind of realize it. Um, I mean, certain things are from things that people actually said in the jewelry industry, um, but there, it's very, it's, I would say every character is a composite of different people. I mean, you, you know, there's always different types and, and stuff like that, but, um, yeah, there, you know, th there's a lot of dialogue that is things that I've heard from different diamond dealers that I put in there. And I think that uh, helps the authenticity of it a lot. 
Well, sure. And we'll get to Max in a minute because he's yeah, about yeah. as authentic as it gets. Uh, but let's talk about Mimi. Um, you mentioned this, the, the story's main character and protagonist is named Mimi Rosa. Now, um, without giving anything away, she starts out, she's a divorced Jewish woman who married outside the faith. She failed at her marriage. She failed at her job. And now she's returning with her tail between her legs to work with family. Rob, it would be a lot easier to give us a protagonist who has confidence and powerful allies and resources. But the characters who have those things in your story are very secondary. What was it that made you choose Mimi Rosen as your champion? Um. Well, I like the idea of somebody being forced. You know, I made this decision so long ago that um, I, I, can't, I can barely remember like my thought process, but I would say in general, um, you know, I always believe in champion the underdog and to have kind of a, you know, and it has actually been something that people have, have remarked that I kind of have a, a, a not always confident and not always competent uh, main character, which is, um, you know, people are used to these kind of flawless, you know, not scared exactly heroes right. who do everything. And, you know, mine, I tried to keep it, I would say, true to life in that if you, if somebody would actually investigate a murder, I mean, they would make mistakes, right? Because that's, people make mistakes, just like, you know, I've been doing what I'm doing for 30 years, I still make mistakes. And I still put my foot in it. And I mean, I think that's just how people are, right? So yeah, I wanted to make her um, a bit of a underdog. And, you know, I think in some ways it parallels uh, my journey in that I wanted to be just a, a journalist and I ended up in this kind of specialty. And at first I was like, well, this is, you know, I got into it uh, after a long time after my grandfather died, but I was thinking, well, this is going backwards. This is, you know, you know, this is weird to be in this kind of thing that my family did. But, but in the end, I think that ended up being one of the better parts of it. The fact that I have this kind of um, emotional kind of attachment to it. And I kind of, you know, especially not so much now, but in the beginning, you know, I would meet people who knew my grandfather and it was just very it was just very interesting to kind of see his kind of natural uh you know the, where he kind of uh did his work for so many years so i want to go back though to when you just said that you you know you talk about your perspective as a journalist what's interesting is that you introduce mimi as a failed journalist now you're mm -hmm. a journalist but you're successful and well connected was it challenging to put yourself in mimi's mindset and how did you approach that no, I mean, I think every journalist, you feel like, you know, the, 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 you know, the doors are closing in on you. It's, it's tough, you know, it's a tough field right now. So, um, uh, I mean, I have been out of work, uh, not recently, thankfully, but, um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, you know, a lot of the people I know who are journalists are having a tough time right now. So it's not necessarily, something that's you know something you hear about all the time so and it's a question like you know people who devote their lives to to this craft which i feel is an important thing you know people complain or whatever but i i do think it's important and it has a huge role to play in our society like what what do they do and where do they go so in this case she just happened you know to end up in the diamond industry so you know which is helpful for a a mystery. <laughs> a it couldn't, of couldn't be a better yeah. setting, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, you know, I'm going to extend on what I was saying about her, her existence as a failed journalist. It's not, it's not really that. Like from the first paragraph where she exits the subway, I started feeling the way she felt seeing things through her eyes. And frankly, Rob, it, it was a little bit depressing. Like it took, takes a few chapters to sort of get into the rhythm. So was that was that designed from the first? Did you want readers to get wrapped up in her flaws from the beginning? I mean, you want people to be, you know, it's interesting because when I was writing it, I have a writing group and I would get a, like a lot of feedback and people would be like, well, this is an obnoxious character. And I, I personally didn't find her obnoxious. I was like, well, this is just how people are, you know, they put their foot in it. So, I mean, you obviously want people to be sympathetic uh, towards your main character. Um, 
I mean, I hope it's not depressing. I mean, I think she just feels, you know, that she's trapped. But I think a lot, you know, a lot of people feel that way, right? You know, you know, I think that's one of the things that I try to discuss in the book is that most people don't get what they want in life, right? And you know, you have to make sacrifices and you have to make compromises. Uh, we all have, and um, that's uh, that's it. Well, so as a side note, I would tell the audience that the, the what I call the depressing start, it actually makes the total journey more impactful to me as we reach the catharsis and the denouement. I would like to thank you for that, by the way. A lot of first time authors and screenwriters kind of end stories abruptly. So it might be my Generation X showing, but I appreciate you walking us to the door after the, the big events in the story with a little epilogue. Um, and to wrap up that character, who who is the, the character arc is great. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you that might be interesting for our audience about uh, the development of Mimi? I mean, you know, it was, I mean, I'm always interested in what women think. And uh, my wife gave me a lot of feedback about, you know, what it's like to, you know, be a woman. So that was a bit challenging and that definitely made it interesting. And, you know, at first I, I was like, well, I can't do that. But then you think about like, okay, you can put sexism in there. I mean, you know, there's, there's different ways that you can go with it, you know, as a woman in a male dominated industry. So I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always curious if people find, find her likable or not, because I was always surprised that, that people didn't. But um, uh, well, by, the, I, by I, the end, I thought she was eminently likable. And by the end, I felt like, we had we had problem solved with her. I mean, just from my perspective, Rod, you created. It's funny, you know. We we talk about movie logic, right? You see somebody yeah. doing something, you go, "Oh, there's no way they would do that," and you gave us a few of those, which made me wonder what was coming around the corner. So, I I really think it's a it's a great character, and it's it strikes me that you said that you developed her years ago, because quite candidly, in in today's culture, it's a type of character that I think we need. So, bravo yeah. on that. Well, thanks. I mean, it, it's interesting that people definitely take cues by the way other characters react to it. So if other characters have a bad reaction to something she says, then the uh, then that kind of colors their reaction. Whereas if I, you know, I could just say people have people say all sorts of things and if nobody reacts then it's kind of considered fine in that world. So that's I mean, funny I that you say that because one of the things that was enjoyable about the book is anybody who's ever visited the Diamond District, when she would say something, whether it was something that made you go, no, or it was something that was brilliant, the reactions were so authentic. And so I want to go to the lighter side now and talk about Mimi's father, Max, the other character I wanted to bring up. This, this is a great character, my personal favorite. Um, so in my review of your book, which is available in the Price Scope blog, I described him as the perfect caricature of a modest New York diamond tear on the grind. Now, for anyone in our audience who has not been to the district, Rob, how would you describe Max Rosen? I mean, I, you know, the kind of character he is, is not, you don't necessarily see that much anymore, but he's kind of like, when I, especially when I came into the business, he was kind of like the standard kind of like old time, you know, honest, just making a living kind of guy, you know, religious, you know, uh, you know, kind of fell into the industry, but, you know, was, you know, had a certain passion about it and a certain feel for it. And, you know, fundamentally decent and caring, though, you know, old fashioned. And also he sometimes puts his foot in it or doesn't say the right thing or gets angry. Uh, you know, I tried to make these characters as much as I could well-rounded in that, you know, they're not, they're not, they all screw up and they all make mistakes. And it's, you know, and I guess if there was a, a thought that I wanted to convey, was, you know, we hear so much about, you know, people at 47th Street and the diamond industry in general. And, you know, I wanted to give kind of my experience of it, which is that it's an industry with people and some of them are good and some of them are not so good. And, you know, it's, and some of them have good days and bad days and it's just people making a living like any other business, you know, like certainly publishing or 
online or or anything you know and i think it was it was in a way trying to demystify it you know and saying this is just people and so um, did you have people, when you grew but, up you said you said that um I believe you now you modeled Max. I know he's the character's not modeled, but your your grandfather. Did in your family were people speaking Yiddish? Yeah, yeah. Okay. My grandfather, so, yeah, yeah. So, so we got yeah, a, yeah most got of the Yiddish, Yiddish glossary in the book. I'm just letting our Yeah, and I would say just about every word was something I've heard. Like I didn't try to find words that I've never heard. You know what I'm saying? These are words that oh, yeah. I've heard people use in, in everyday speech. Well, so. I'll, I'll admit most of it, of course, I've, I've heard just being around the business, but I uh, I learned a few things. So that was great. <laughs> People um, like the glossary for some reason. It was, uh, <laughs> it was very well. Well, so I'm a visual learner. And yeah. so these two characters, I try to visualize who I would have play them. Like if uh, Price Scope starts a streaming service and we produce a murderers forever, um, the famous actors that would play Mimi and Max. Do you have any ideas along those lines? You know, I've never gotten this question before. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you have ideas. Uh, I do. And I, I caught you off guard. I had a chance to think about it, but I yeah. thought about it all through the book. First of all, from chapter one, uh, Max is Judd Hirsch. Like um, Judd played a, played a Jewish uh, protagonist father in the Independence Day movies, which would be perfect for that. Mm hmm. Mimi was harder because she's such a unique protagonist. And I don't recall a movie actor with her story arc necessarily, but by the end, I could absolutely see Jennifer Connelly playing her, just so you know. All right. Well, we'll uh, call her agents. Okay. Uh, that sounds great. Good. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, the, obviously, Taxi and Ordinary People and uh, Independence Day. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, the the kind of uh kind of solid uh kind of menchy kind of person uh, that's what you're kind of looking for a perfect so. word by the way okay so let's spend another couple minutes on this book which by the way is available on amazon for a crazy mm -hmm. low price um yeah. so to me rob bates writing a murder mystery set in the diamond district is kind of like bob costas writing a murder mystery set in the olympics or gordon ramsay writing a murder mystery like set within the restaurant industry, meaning you've got a rock solid foundation of inside knowledge um, that probably informs things. I wanted to ask you about the USGR. So this is a foremost diamond grading authority with a bribing scandal in its past. Mm -hmm. Coincidence to things you've reported on in the real world. Why was that included in the story? Well, you know, first of all, there's been a bunch of bri bribing scandals, so I don't want to single any uh, organization out. I mean, there's been a bunch of it, it's happened. Um, I wanted to write about something that hadn't. You know, one of the things they 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 tell you when you're writing mysteries is to, you know, write about things that are in the headlines. So that was a story that I covered. Um, and again, there have been a, there's been a bunch of them, so I don't want to necessarily single any particular organization out. Um, and it's obviously completely, completely, completely fictionalized. Um, yes. no, it, it has no real relation. And I would mention Rob, just right, in right. support of what you're saying, um, <laughs> about the second or third time this happened, you wrote passionately to the authorities to please stop letting this happen. So yeah. I know it's something that has affected you. And so that was um, that's what motivates my question. But it's a chicken egg question. Was it in the story because you were reflecting what happens in real life? Or did you need something in the story? And that just happened to serve the purpose. I think that, you know, you think about what you're going to write about. Right. And like the second book is on artisanal miners, which is another big topic in the industry. So it's on a totally different subject. But you you just think about, I mean, I wanted to write about something that hadn't been written about before. Like I could have done Blood Diamonds or I could have done like a Diamond Heist or, but th that had all been done and this had not been done. And I mean, I think it's a, I, you know, the, the idea of valuation of, of diamonds and how we value people and i mean i just think it's I, it's an interesting topic 
you know, because it is so subjective and it can be filtered through different kinds of, of biases. So that was kind of uh, one of the uh, impetuses, you know, again, I, you, you, I wanted to do something that hadn't been covered so much before. So, right. so that was that, and maybe it might've been more commercial if I did blood diamonds right off the bat. But, well, it's, um, it's interesting that you say that because your choices, there's so much, by the way, there's so much in there and we don't have time to go into it all right, we right. Need to get to our next section. But, you know, from 47th on street level, would you call a sparkly flea market perfectly yes, to yeah. describing the insides of the diamond district buildings, which are complicated from shabby, comp, you know, cramped offices to these luxurious places. There's so much, I mean, Borses, bagel shops, this melting pot. So, I know you've got another book coming. It's your second one. You said you've just finished it, which is fabulous. I'm curious. Um, the pandemic has changed much of what we do, probably during the time that you were conceiving and, and putting this down. As you approach these next books, are they in a post-COVID world, a, a world where COVID never existed? Right now, my choice is to be a world where COVID never existed just because it's hard, you know, I, I might change my mind on that, but certainly the first two don't reflect COVID. And I, I think hopefully, you know, at least by the time the second or third comes out, nobody's going to want to talk about it anymore. So um, people will be sick of hearing about it. We hope because it'll be done. Um, and it's hard. I mean, it is very hard. And, you know, the, uh, the, I talked with the editor and the agent about it, and they both said, if you feel it has a role, put it in. If you don't, ignore it, you know? Um, and uh, I mean, I think this is like novelists, you know, around September 11th had kind of the same kind of issues. Like, do we, do we put this in? And in, in retrospect, it's probably good. It makes it more timeless, the fact that they didn't include that. So uh, I'm not at this point mentioning COVID, you know, it's, uh, I could change my mind on that. I don't know. We'll I mean, have to see. Like but now, the, the other or, big topic, which is partially based by COVID and something I don't think is ever going to go away. You know, the internet has been so heavily leveraged for the past year. We've got rough diamond sales online, uh, some with in-person viewing, some by Alrosa, which is completely done digitally with scan yeah. technology. We've got uh, auctions online. Sotheby's recently accepted $12 million in crypto uh, for a 101 karat diamond. Um, online sales of diamonds and jewelry went way up last year. And of course, price scope. So what about that? Are we going to get a uh, the digital side of the diamond trade mentioned or involved in future installments? Yeah, I would like to do something. And, you know, one thing I haven't written about, and I don't necessarily it's not scheduled for the third book at least yet is lab grown, which I have not, I don't mention. I mean, I'm, I, I always mention it, but it's not a big deal, but yeah, I would like to get the whole kind of um, one of the things that's, that's interesting for me about writing about the jewelry industry and diamond industry. And one of the reasons why I've been, you know, kind of it keeps you interested for so long is it kind of gives you a window into different things. Like it gives you into window into politics, gives you a window into Hollywood, and it gives you a window into Silicon Valley. So I've known people in Hollywood and Silicon Valley, and they all kind of intersect kind of briefly in the in the diamond industry and they'll have different reactions. So yeah, at some point I would like to talk about online, whether it's in Silicon Valley, whether it's you know lab grown in particular or well, something. you know, one of your characters could make a breakthrough discovery thanks to the help of the online community at, at Diamond Scope. Something there you go. You yeah, never know. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, you know, there is an online community in uh, in the book, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's just there's just, I mean, one of the things that is cool about this, you know, writing about it, and certainly from a novelist standpoint, is there's just so many issues and scandals and good things too, and just it's just it's just. I, you know, I hate to use a cliche, but it's multifaceted as far as like, you know, uh, you know, there's just a lot to it because it intersects on so many different things, whether it's online or celebrities or politics, international politics. So I think that's what that's what makes it interesting. Well, OK, then right back at you. Thank you for bringing clarity to the top topic with such a colorful story. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> a Murder is Forever is available from Amazon. We're going to put the link in the chat. Yes. Folks, 
It costs less than a meal at a fast food restaurant. It has zero calories and it's an engaging, convincing journey with a really unique and special world and a great protagonist. Um, so I'd like to wrap up the book part here, Rob. Um, I'd like to remind the audience also, if you're so inspired to send any questions you have, uh, we'll choose some to answer before we end today. Uh, I would also encourage you to go to Price, Corp's, uh, Price Scope's resources menu and check out our vendors and advertisers, some of the most recognizable and reputable sellers in the world, supporting Price Scope and making events like this webinar possible. So moving to part two, Rob. Yeah, if I could just mention one thing, uh, Amazon, this, so this is another weird thing. Amazon is selling it for far less than I personally, as the author, could buy it. So I don't know why they're doing that. I don't think it's like a lost leader that's like uh, driving in sales, but uh, uh, trust me, they're losing money on every uh, on every purchase. So uh, if you if you don't like Amazon, this is a good way to hurt them. I would buy it quickly uh, just before quickly, they raise the price. It, it keeps getting cheaper. It's a, it's amazing to me, but uh, whatever. So moving on, Rob. In your case, I think that truth may be even more interesting than fiction. I said at the top that you have one of the most interesting and enviable jobs in the business. I'd like to talk a bit about your career, uh, your favorite moments, and then some hot topics. Um, tell us about how you got into the business, uh, what you were doing prior before uh, you got to JCK. Well, so this is how long I've been doing this. Uh, I was in college. Um, and uh, I did some freelance work for some, some local newspapers. I wrote for the college newspaper. And uh, I was looking for a job. And uh, I, you know, Martin Rappaport, this was when he just started his newsletter. It was like six pages, right? Um, and um, the, you know, he needed a, I, I told him, oh, yeah, I knew the, you know, my grandfather's in the business. I knew the business. It was, it was BS, but, you know, he pitied me and he hired me. And then I went from there and I, I went to National Jeweler and, and it's been JC Case. This has been most of my uh, career has been uh, doing this. Um, and, you know, again, what I do like about it is that you're learning, you learn a lot. I mean, like, I don't, I don't cover colored gemstones that much, but I'm, I'm starting to, like I just thought about Afghanistan and, and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just, you, I really do feel like I'm learning a lot, which is like one of the great things about being a journalist is that you, it's always about you're always learning and it's it's just very interesting in that way speaking of that you've seen an awful lot in this business and for that matter just being a new yorker you've lived there through both 9 11 and and the pandemic so i'd rather go positive here over your career what industry story or event have you covered or uncovered which you really enjoyed the most which gave you great pleasure or pride well hmm I mean, you know, as a as a journalist, you tend to focus on the negative, so a lot, a lot of it has the negative. Um, but I think that the industry has made a lot of strides as far as you know. It used to be uh, run by a monopoly; it's no secret. Um, it isn't anymore, and I think it's you know it's it's transitioned probably better than we could have expected. Um, the idea, I think that, you know, I, I think, uh, for a long time, you know, the world is getting smaller in a way. So it's like, it used to be, you know, here people are on 47th street and here are the people in Africa. Right. And it's, you don't, they don't really mix. Right. Cause they're, you know, and the jewelers in the Midwest, they have no connection with the people in Africa. And I think now that the world is getting smaller, I think there's an idea of like, we have a mutual responsibility and you just don't go into countries, uh, though plenty of people unfortunately still do, you just, you ideally, you don't go into countries and just take their resources, but you, you try to uh, give the people a fair shake and invest in the, in the, the people and in the country and you know not everybody has gotten that message and not everybody that still does that but a lot of you know and this is i'm not just talking about diamonds and talk about gems and talk about some other resources also but um i think there are a lot of people who really do feel that responsibility and when you see it at work it's great i mean when you when people really do you know when diamonds are a legitimate uh 
engine for African development, which they are in certain cases. I mean, that's that's really great. I mean, you're talking about some of the, the poorest, most hard up countries in the world. So um, I think that's really important. And, you know, it's again, it's, it, it's far, far from perfect, but I'd like to see that kind of, uh, you know, really uh, go. And I think there is a lot more pressure, a lot more consumer pressure, a lot more pressure from banks and from governments to uh, to continue that. So there's certainly strides in corporate social responsibility. We've seen so much more being done there. So thank you. I think that's I think that's great. Now, of course, that begs the question on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, as you said, as a journalist, there are some things which are not necessarily to be celebrated. What was your least favorite thing to have covered or uncovered? Something that you really didn't enjoy reporting on, even though you needed to do it? Well, I mean, you know, I do know people who have gotten into big trouble and, you know, they're people I liked. And um, I just, I feel bad for them. You know, there are people I know who are, you know, who I they always struck me as decent people who ended up in, in major scandals. And, um, you know, you, you just feel really bad and it, it, it makes you, you know, you try to be gingerly about it because you know that they're decent people, but you also, you know, it's something you, you feel you have to do. Um, I mean, I'm not one of, I wouldn't say I'm not one of those journalists who, I, I don't like get off on like ripping people apart. It's not like my, you know, I feel bad. I mean, I do, I feel a certain responsibility like about what I write and that, you know, people are gonna be reading it and people are gonna be, you know, forming perceptions about people based on what I write. And I try to keep that in mind. You know, um, I've had lawsuit threats. So that's, I've never, thank God, been sued, but I, I find that very unpleasant. And that really is, you know, uh, I, I'd say most of the people who threaten me are, are now in serious <laughs> legal trouble. So um, I don't really have to worry about them, but, um, uh, you know, that's, so that's unpleasant. Um, but, you know, it's, it is sad in a way to see a lot, you know, the, the kind of Max Rosens of the book, you know, you don't see that many of them anymore. And the business is kind of shifting away towards bigger companies and towards more formal structure. And I think there's, there is something good in that and that, you know, they are, they do feel a certain, you know, need for corporate social responsibility and for transparency and some of this stuff, but you do lose something. So it's kind of like, and that's also something I tried to reflect in the book that, you know, the industry is changing and you gain and you lose. And maybe the best combination is a combination of Mimi and Max, you know, the kind of more forward thinking and the more traditional, you know, you keep, you try to keep the best of both and move forward in that way. Okay. That's very fair. Um, and I do think, by the way, for the record, um, you're read by an awful lot of people and I've been reading you for about as long as you've been in the business, not quite actually, I didn't get into the business until after you were, you were uh, journalisting, but um, your reporting is extremely fair. It's extremely balanced and you probably get to hear that, but I certainly wanted uh, to be on the record with Price Scope as saying that we're, we're big fans. Um, in that respect, I look forward to discussing some topics with you that are a bit hot today. Um, you can feel free to approach from a journalistic or a personal standpoint. What are your first thoughts when I say lab-grown diamonds? I mean, you know, they're here to stay. I mean, it's been a fascinating thing to cover. Um, I, you know, I think they're an interesting technology. I think in the end, most of these companies, especially the bigger ones, are going to pivot to the technology aspect because that's the real money. That's where really the money is. Um, you know, I... I do feel I've played a bit of a role in changing the conversation as far as the eco aspect of it. Well, I think, you know, in the beginning, it was kind of uh, broadly accepted that these are more eco-friendly. And then when you kind of looked into it, you realized, A, you weren't getting any information on this. And B, you know, there is all sorts of nuances. And, you know, they, these things take incredible amounts of electricity to to produce so and you know there are some they use renewable energy and, and that's good and that's, but, you're, but you're right on topic uh here because it's something i'm also watching and i know we've got sas global who's developing certain standards and and others 
But with so many producers in areas of the world where there's no hydroelectricity, what are the chances that there's there can be a significant movement towards any kind of sustainability or carbon neutrality? Uh, in lab grown diamonds, I mean, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see. I think, you know, if you if they're produced in China, you know, it's chances are they're not going to be that ecologically friendly. I mean, it's all about being, you know, value for money. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that if you if you want something that really bugs me, it's the idea that these things are being sold. And again, there are some companies who do who who are who are you know use renewable energy and really care, and that's fine. But you know, there's they're they're kind of being sold broadly as a category as something that's eco friendly, and they're making global warming worse. And I mean, to me, that's like that's it's almost it it's so it, it's almost evil because if you if you think about you know you know as I do, as climate change is a real um, uh, issue, oh. then, then, you know, you, you shouldn't be playing games with it. You shouldn't be saying, oh, this is eco-friendly when we're, you know, we're putting all sorts of CO2 in the atmosphere. So that to me is a real, that really annoys me. And it, and it certainly, you know, it's something I think a lot of people in the media have kind of bought kind of wholesale. And, uh, again, there are, there are companies that, that, are carbon neutral and you know do, do their best to minimize their footprint but you know the fact is there is a footprint and you know you look on these sites and there's people saying that we have no economic we have no ecological impact whatsoever and there's no product on earth that has no it, it's a it's a moronic idea it's so stupid that like that, that you could have something that has no ecological impact or social impact like everything has an impact yes. so um uh, if, you, yeah. if you don't mind me jumping on and beating, yeah, sure, the, sure. beating the drum the same way, but Rob, I'd, I'd also say, look, we're all about, Triscope, we're all about transparent and truthful advertising and promotion. So if you are one of these companies who has gone through the sustainability certification and you can demonstrate it, then great, talk about that. The thing that I really am concerned about right now is the pell-mell lab-grown sellers who are not only saying that without having any proof, but also reviving the term conflict-free after our industry has pivoted and come together in a way like no other industry to try and overcome things which have geopolitical roots. And at this point, talking about CSR, corporate social responsibility, and the revenue stream that goes upstream to benefit all of the indigenous people in some of the world's most remote locations, I just want to beat the drum a little bit and say, I think lab grown diamonds are super cool. I really do. At the same time, you don't need to say conflict free and you don't certainly don't need to say eco friendly unless you can demonstrate it. So thank you yeah. for that. I think we're on the same page. Yeah. And eco friendly. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's a ridiculous term, right? Because what is not, there's no, everything is eco friendly. I mean, it's, it's so nebulous. And I think that's what the, the Federal Trade Commission has has actually warned some of these people not to say that because it's such it's such a nebulous term that you know it, it could mean anything you know and even conflict free I mean you know there are uh, lab grown diamonds uh, companies that are owned by some pretty um, shady characters you know and in you know I mean I know a lot more than I've published. But you know there are there are some some people who who are definitely people to avoid. So you know the idea that these are quote unquote ethical because you produce them in a factory rather than a mine, it you know it it doesn't hold up. It's all about the individual impact of the of the diamond and whether you know that can be proven and demonstrated. It's well, not to wrap, to wrap a bow around all of it. I think it's safe to say that. First of all, truthful advertising is important. And so you need to know the truth of what the product is that you're selling. And second, you should promote a product on its own merits. You shouldn't try to chop off some other sector's head to try and make yourself look taller. Um, right. We've got about another minute before we wanna to get to some questions. So we've had some questions submitted. So just ask you for your outlook on this topic. This is for our price scope audience. Um, talked to earlier about how the internet is becoming leveraged more and more. Um, overall sales of diamonds and jewelry were down in 2020, but 
Online sales grew by 22.5%. There are more sellers online today than ever. I think our community can be considered early adopters of digital sparkle. Um, what about the future, Rob? Do you think that future online sales will ever break that 10 to 12% markets hovered at for some years? I mean, they, they may be now for all we know. I mean, it's very hard to get uh, uh, real data on this. I mean, it all depends on COVID really. Um, uh, I think most people do, uh, especially with diamonds and jewelry, they'd like to see it. I mean, they, they like to, you know, I mean, you can buy online, but I think most people do like to be walked through the process. But I do think that things that like, for example, it used to be you called somebody on the phone, now you have these video conferences where they kind of show you, they walk you through the diamond. So, you know, there are things that are, are going to replicate it. I mean, obviously online is huge. It's, it's the quote unquote future. Um, and, you know, we'll just see how people feel after, you know, when all this settles down, if it, uh, assuming it settles down, um, uh, you know, whether people are going to go back to their old habits or whether they're going to uh, buy online and how much the online process can, can adapt. So, well, there are there are like luxury brands that suddenly have ring builders on their sites that never had it before. So I think that it's um, it's interesting. So thank you for that. And we'll see where it's going to go. Um, we've come to time for our audience participation. So we've got some uh, questions that have been submitted. And I'd like to thank members of the audience for letting us interact with Rob on your behalf. We will, if we don't get to the question, by the way, we'll follow up with, uh, with an email and point to, um, to those questions, answers to those questions. Uh, first question is this, did you choose the mystery genre because you've always enjoyed those stories or do you feel the diamond industry just lends itself best to that type of story? For example, diamond movies seem like heist movies all the time. Um, I just thought it was commercial. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, now I'm a big mystery reader, but I wasn't uh, when I started. I just thought it was a commercial idea. Um, I don't probably think I have the chops to write a real piece of literary fiction. Um, so that kind of <laughs> rules everything else out. Um, yeah, I just thought it was commercial and, you know, I thought it obviously lent itself to, to that. And there's, Really, I mean, I've read a lot and there hasn't been that many uh, books set on 47th Street, you know, and certainly not in the last couple of years. So I think it was it was something that was kind of relatively new. And I, you know, I also like the fact that it kind of, you know, shows you different subcultures that perhaps mm. people aren't necessarily familiar with, whether it's the, you know, Orthodox and Hasidic Jewish subculture or the Indian uh, subculture. It kind of gives you a window into uh, th those cultures and, and those traditions. And again, you know, it's usually you come out with the idea that they're just people like anyone else. But um uh, I, you know, I think it's, it's interesting for that. And I think, you know, what, what, what's cool about the mystery genre is it's, it's very setting dependent. So you, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot about the setting and it's usually about a small town, um, where like everybody starts getting murdered all the time. So, um, uh, I, I tell you what, you, you mentioned just now, you mentioned some of these cultures and subcultures. And the cool thing for me about the book was, not only did you aggregate them, but you also positioned them in such a way that we had quite a few red herrings swimming around in that story, Rob. So that was really well composed and, and well done. So that's a, that's a great question. And it's good that you called it the Diamond District Murder Mystery Series. Um, interested in seeing if it'll ever, you know, maybe we uh, follow the Vandercleft family and see what's going on with them upstream somewhere. Maybe you'll have to include a Flemish glossary if we do that, huh? Yes. So our next question here is, um, you mentioned that the jewelry industry is historically male dominated. What are some changes you are seeing or believe you will see as more women or more diverse groups join the industry? And do you feel there's more opportunity for diversity in the industry? Um, yeah, obviously I feel there's more opportunity for diversity in the industry. Um, look, you know, we're a, a more diverse country. Right. And, you know, when you go to shows and it's mostly, you know, white men again, and I, I think it's I think it's definitely changed over the last, let's say, five years or so. 
Um, I think it's hard for them to uh, to necessarily relate to you know younger consumers, and you know I, I'm an old uh, you know white Jewish uh, ball guy, so you know it's. Um, but I think it's important to to say you know, especially since since you know jewelry is a female oriented product, you know it's just I, I think it's important to understand the consumer. Um, I think it's important to, you know, to go to different locales. So yeah, I think it's, it's extremely important and I think it will, uh, keep changing. I mean, you know, um, you know, things have changed a lot over the last couple of years. I mean, it's really been amazing. The, the kind of psychological shifts in, in certain ways. So have you had a chance to meet some of the industry players? Have you met Ira Thomas with, uh, with Lucara by any chance? I mean, I talked to her and I met oh. her. Um, and so, yeah, you, we've got a number of very, very strong uh, female personas who have ascended to positions of power in the business. Um, mm -hmm. Are you seeing a greater trend of that since you started in the business? And where do you see that going? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no look, I, I used to call it the beers. There was no uh, the, the amount of women executives were zero. I mean, like there was none. Right. Um uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely seeing that. I mean, you know, a lot of the big, uh, jewelry companies now are, uh, especially retailers are owned by, are run, I should say, by, by women like Signet and Ellsberg and, uh, uh, a few others. I mean, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of room and I think what's, what's really interesting is that a lot of the energy from the industry is coming from smaller kind of younger people who, you know, just start making jewelry and sell on Instagram. And, you know, sometimes it really catches fire, you know, and sometimes they do very well and they're not necessarily kind of um, uh, recorded in kind of the standard uh, industry kind of guides and stuff like that. But um, that's where a lot of the energy in the industry is, is these smaller players who, Hey, I want to make jewelry and people relate to it. And it, it becomes a lot more personal, you know, because you are dealing with the people who make the object, right? So they are communicating to you through Instagram and it, in many ways, it's kind of back to the roots of the industry, which is, you know, the fact that like Tiffany and Cartier and all these, they, they were real people. They were real families. Yes. Right. And there used to be people who stood behind those names before they be kind of became these iconic names. Right. So it's it's in that way. I think that's uh, you, you, if you want to see where the future is and it's it's in that realm and they're obviously very concerned about social issues and they, they take a stand and it, it's just a more personal um, connection with, uh, with their buyers. Yeah, I, I think you're dead on, especially given the way that the new generations of consumers are consuming. Um, they, you know, people who have uh, such a role to play, people who have those kinds of personalities can reach more people more easily than ever. Um, the next question here is, what are some of the more surprising industry trends you've noticed or reported on? Or are you surprised? <laughs> I mean, I was a little, you know, I have to say I was a little shy. You know, you talked a little bit about Complete Diamonds before. Um, and the Kimberly process has had issues and it's kind of gone forward and backslid a little bit. And, but, you know, the idea that, you know, it really looked like the industry was in trouble for a while. And then the, 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 you know, people were very pragmatic. They said, okay, they basically, I mean, you know, it, it's funny to hear all these criticisms about the Kimberly process. I mean, this was something that the NGOs, that the activist groups, I should say, wanted, right? This is something they pushed for. Right. That they that and, you know, they were just very pragmatic, like, OK, if this is what you want, we'll do it. And it's just it is a. I mean, one of the one of kind of the biggest faults and the the its, it's biggest strengths and weaknesses It is so ambitious. It aims to track every diamond in the world. And uh, that's difficult. Right. But and you had to get like 80 countries to sign on. So it's you know, I think that's been surprising. Um, I think the so many people jumping on the lab grown bandwagon has been 
surprising to me. Um, and just the different reactions it's gotten among the industry and among people. I mean, I, I just, there's just a lot of interesting things. When you say jumping on the lab drum bandwagon, are you referring to uh, professionals or to consumers or both? Yeah, both. I mean, I think just so many companies are getting into it. You know, uh, they don't always want you to know that they're into it, but just so many companies have gotten into it. Uh, I mean, most site holders, you know, have some kind of venture. Um, um yeah and you know i think the consumer acceptance i honestly the consumer acceptance was not that surprising to me but i think it surprised the industry because i think the industry had always been kind of had this mindset that that natural is better and wasn't necessarily kind of taken aback by this you know the idea of um you know well so so like your thoughts and, on that because i yeah. We noticed that baubles and trinkets certainly uh, are being consumed at a, at a high rate. Um, presuming the diamond engagement tradition remains strong, thinking about next generations, do you think there will ever be a significant percentage of people who elect to, pros, to propose rather with a diamond that's younger than the bride-to-be is? Um, you know, there are people who propose CZ engagement rings. I mean, you know, people do all sorts of things, you know, it's uh you know people have different budgets and different needs and different um you know ideas about what's what's good and what's bad and you know uh one of the things that we're starting to see is that i mean here's here's another thing that's, that's always been fascinating to me is that like for for all these years the beers was kind of the sole diamond advertiser right and then all of a sudden for 10 years it stopped and you started to see you know they still sold tons of diamonds, right? So it still had this kind of long tail, but you definitely started to lose steam. And now you're starting to see uh, diamond producers, uh, both uh, through this natural diamond council, but also through De Beers, like saying, okay, you know, we can't, we need to um, uh, promote our product like we did before, or it's people aren't going to buy it. That's, so. There's there's a big disconnect there, Rob. You're exactly right. There's a huge disconnect between players like El Rosa, who just pledged another uh, 60 million over the next five years to Yakutia with their arrangement with the government of Yakutia, building infrastructure, building community centers. You've got the beers who pumped two and a half million into Namibia and Botswana to sustain their workforce during COVID while they were shut down. And nobody's talking about that that I can see in a loud way to promote natural diamonds. So I think that there is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy if the natural diamond sector doesn't do what it needs to to promote the benefits and the positives, then there's some cannibalization that's gonna take place that could otherwise be avoided. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But, and I think the other thing is that you know, De Beers does that. And, you know, when De Beers does a good thing, in a way, it doesn't necessarily reflect on the whole natural diamond industry. It just reflects on them, right? Because there are some good people in the business and there's some bad people in the business. And I think that, uh, and you see this with the lab grown too, is that there's this idea that, you know, diamond business is one thing. And it isn't one thing, you know, there are good players and there are bad players. And I wish that the bad players were all gone, but I, know that they're not right so i think you have to say um i i think these companies are starting to realize that you can't it can't just be like diamond quote unquote is a brand right it is you know if you do something good that reflects well on you right um and that's fine you know if if i do something good that doesn't reflect well on all new yorkers i'm just one guy right you know and there's mo there's different you know so and if i do something bad same thing so it it's it's a matter of you know treating every diamond and every company uh, on an individual level and looking at its social impact well that's a great place to start wrapping up here. We have a couple more questions, but, and one of them is very technical. We will make sure and answer those in a thread on price scope and we'll get an email out to everybody with, with a list of the answers to the questions. Um, Rob, can't thank you enough for the time. It's a great final message to end on. 
A reminder, folks, get your copy of A Murder is Forever. Um, Amazon's selling it below the price they should be for. It's an opportunity. Look for Murder is a Girl's Best Friend coming soon. Uh, Rob's award-winning blog is called Cutting Remarks. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Rob Bates Author and on his website, uh, robbatesauthor.com. Let me share that for you. Um, that website lists everything I just said, by the way. If you're not a member of the Price Scope community, registration is free and easy. Like us on Facebook and Insta, check out the Price Scope blog and jump on into the forum. The water is fine. Rob, my thanks to you and everyone who attended. Have a great day. Okay.